Since the 1970s, the film industry has been contending with the chin. Now, Gareth Miles and Simon Appleton examine each year in the career of Bruce Campbell. Hey, hold on. I, I didn't do any of this. It wasn't me. It was somebody else. He's still here. You're letting him get away. Hello and welcome to A Year in the Career, the podcast that looks at the career of Bruce Campbell one year at a time. I'm your host, Gareth. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Gareth Miles, and I also have my GarethMiles.com. That's G A R E T H M Y L E S for anyone interested. Uh, I'm joined by my cheerful co host, Simon. How are you, Simon? I'm doing well. Keeping busy. Excellent. Where can people find you? You can Simon? find me uh, on Twitter at movie underscore mustache, and you can also find my blog at moviemustache.com. And of course, if you are enjoying the podcast, please do leave us a review on whatever platform it was that you happen to get the podcast from. If you want to get in touch with us, you can by tweeting us or emailing us. Uh, The links are in the notes. And just to throw in your 10 cents, if we've made a mistake or you want just generally want to give us a bit of love, then let us know. It goes both ways, of course, if you wish to promote something or you want us to investigate something you think would be good for our listeners then let us know get in touch if you've got a bruce campbell property that you think people need to know about this we are totally free to listen to you and we plan to keep it that way so share us with your friends and family and anyone you think that would benefit from listening to our nonsensical ramblings excellent how are things going at the moment all tickety boo excited or yeah yeah enjoying enjoying (laughs) this new uh, journey we find ourselves on and uh, it's, it's definitely a nice way to keep busy in this uh, unusual time that we find ourselves in. Quite rightly. And there's no better time than uh, for you to sit down and watch the entire career of Bruce Campbell one film at a exactly. time, which is what we're doing. And over the last number of weeks, we've looked at a, a great many of his films on a yearly basis. And last uh, in the last episode, we looked at Evil Dead 2 and the episode of Knott's Landing that he happened to be in as well. This week, uh, we have two feature films that he was in during 1988, uh, the first of which is one of my particular favourites of his. Um, This is a little film directed by William Lustig and written by the legendary and sadly passed away, uh, I think it was last year, about this time last year, uh, Larry Cohen, who was an incredible writer, if you ask me, um, was Maniac Cop. Now, I will go as far to say that Maniac Cop is not exactly a a, a totally um, friendly title for anyone who's picking it up off the video store shelf. It kind of says what you'd expect, but I think that Maniac Cop, the film, is a lot more than the title implies. The story is that uh, a police officer is going around killing people and there's one particular sergeant played by Tom Atkins has to try and work out what is actually happening. Could it be a, an actual slasher type affair or is is one of the corrupt cops out there doing it? We're going to be talking spoilers in this, in this podcast. I'm, I'm, maybe I should say that right from the word go. Uh, there, w- there will be spoilers. If you haven't seen it, I recommend watching it before you, you listen to this because there are a number of uh, events that happen during this film that are not typical of the genre. And, and, and that's one of the reasons why I think this film is, is uh, somewhat groundbreaking with, with what it does. So, Simon, had you seen Maniac Cop before we started this thorough investigation into the analysis of the career of Bruce Campbell? Again, I had not. It's one I'd heard of. And I, I knew okay. the very basic premise. As you say, there's a, a cop going around murdering innocent people. But apart from that, I hadn't seen it. And again, I, I thought it was a... It's not a, a great film. I wouldn't say it's a great film. But I thought it was a pretty good thriller. And what I liked about was that going into it, because I didn't read a lot about it, I didn't even look at what genres it covered on IMDb. I tend to avoid those. And what I liked about it is you don't know where this is going. In terms of the maniac cop, you you don't know. Obviously, you know, once you get into it, you've got the young Bruce Campbell, who's uh, maybe not as nice as he, uh, a character as he usually is, but he's the the chief suspect. He's the one that everyone thinks is guilty. And you don't know what's going on is this a horror? Is this some sort of supernatural back from the dead thing? Or is this a more straight, someone has been wronged and is going after or wronging the people that he feels wronged by? 
And that that's what really grabbed me is the who slash what and the why. What what is going on here that really kept me gripped? I was quite uh, surprised to see uh, the father from Lethal Weapon, the one whose daughter dives out the window at the beginning of the movie, uh, as the lead investigator, who again isn't the chiseled typical 80s cop he's not like schwarzenegger in one of his police roles or or even bruce willis he's actually a troubled guy himself he's not he's he's an older man he's not in particularly good shape and as it mentions in the film he's had a uh, a tough time of it he's not had the easiest life or the easiest career and it's him out on a limb trying to get to the truth whereas everyone else thinks he's either crazy or following some trail that isn't there mm-hmm. it was just clever little tricks like like how we don't see the, the maniac cop's face we can see that he's built like a brick shit house but apart from that we we can't see any we have no idea and it's that intrigue that really sort of drew me in on this one hmm. there's a there's a number of plot developments that happen along the way and of the, of those I'm going to mention one of the, one particular spoiler that happens halfway through the film where it uh, removes one lead and allows a second lead to take over the investigation mm-hmm. um by this uh, Tommy Atkins character of Frank McCray is uh, he's killed by the maniac cop um quite brutally and yes yeah and for any film around that time that that wasn't a done thing I can think of one other film in the 80s that actually went and did this, and that's taking what you expect to be the hero of the piece and kills them midway through the film. The other one is, um, there's going to be a spoiler here, uh, To Live and Die in L.A., and it's a, it's a concept that I absolutely love because you don't expect this to happen in the slightest. And so whenever it happened for me the first time, I, I, I was in disbelief going, what's going to happen now you know they've they've presented um bruce campbell's character who is the obvious uh replacement lead but he's he's not a particularly good guy he's leaving his wife in the morning and going and having an affair and you're actually considering that he could actually be the killer of the piece this this film is inventing twists along the way that are actually really reeling in the viewer and on top of that, you're actually getting a level of action in the film and, and intrigue that keeps it really exciting. And I think that the, the film is a, a, a remarkable success. And that, that's what I mean whenever I'm saying that the, the title of Maniac Cop makes you think, oh, it's going to be basically Freddy Krueger or Jason Voorhees as a cop walking around killing teens. But instead, it is it decides to take a more mature route through the storyline um, of being a, a bit of a whodunit and, and and peppers in a number of shock moments that aren't slasher-style moments, but actual uh, big plot reveals or, or plot uh, changers along the way. I really love it for, for those moves that it makes because it's it's different. i tell you what I also liked was that... Um... Obviously, with the as you say, the the twist in who takes the lead in the investigation. What we found was you, you'd expect it be Bruce's character that suddenly becomes the, uh, the 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 guy doing everything. But he he mentions it early on. The other cop involved being a uh, I have no idea how to pronounce that name. Lorene Landon's Mallory. Yeah. Um, he mentions early on how she actually is a better shot than he is on on the range. And we see she is actually a fairly gifted shooter, but she's actually the one who does more of the stuff through him and his circumstances. She hmm. is the one who ends up doing a lot to try and get things done to, to set the record straight and then having to deal with the maniac cop. I, the bit where she runs up to the police car and there's actually a captain sitting in the in, in the or standing by the police car and she just barks at him, you know, officer needs assistance, the killer's in that band, fucking get in the car. And then she, mm-hmm. I will say some of her handling of the shotgun in the car was a bit nerving how the barrel kept drifting near their heads, but um which is rather <laughs> interesting. But um yeah, you know, in general she took charge and, and she wasn't afraid to to get involved and she actually I would have I would argue ends up doing more than, than Bruce does really to to help him out yeah yeah it's it's almost like um they have the three 
leads who are who are getting this done, which which would I think it's a wee bit more realistic. In in any other film, you'd probably have one lead who shares all of the traits mm-hmm. that uh, maybe these three bring to the film, and that that person would be sort of cleaning up the streets and, and getting it all sorted and put it into a nice tidy package. Instead, they break that down into to three ways that they can actually make it make things very unconventional for the viewer. That really helps the film stand out from the crowd. It is the generic title of Maniac Cop, yeah. I think, uh, conjures up an image, not a terribly positive image, in the minds of uh, those who are picking it up off the video shelf to watch. Now, th- this becomes a bit of a franchise, and I, I'm, I'm pleased to say that uh, the unconventional uh, approach carries on into the sequel as well, and the Maniac Cop 1 and 2 sit very, very nicely together, especially like uh, Evil Dead, Evil Dead 2, and Army of Darkness. So you you can sit and watch the two of them back to back, and it's a really pleasing experience uh, because there's you, you don't know where you're going. Uh, a bit like w- what people uh, say of Game of Thrones, where no character was safe. Characters were being killed off left, right, and center. That can happen here so you you you're putting your your trust uh, into a particular character and you, you don't know if they're going to survive the next scene and that, that's a that's a nice way to keep the audience on the edge of their seat yeah. rather than actually just with with scary moments where there's a, a cop who's possibly going to stab these people but, but um maniac cop is is it's notable um I, I i do love the background of this film as well because uh bill lustig had had uh previously directed a film called Maniac back in 1980 starring uh, um, Joe Spinell and that I think they remade that with Elijah Wood recently mm-hmm. as well which I, I haven't seen but uh, the original Maniac was a fairly interesting movie I, I'm not a big fan of it I prefer Maniac Cop greatly over it but it is a fairly nifty dirty dank uh, New York City exploitation thriller and this is the, the next logical step where it establishes a more robust and mature ap- approach to it. Whenever we do get down to actually meeting the maniac cop himself, you're greeted with someone who's genuinely terrifying. Because yeah. the late Robert Zadar is a is a terrific actor. You know, um, Bruce Campbell's nicknamed the Chin. Yes. And I think it's uh, coming back to Tango and Cash, which we mentioned uh, in the last. Or a couple of podcasts ago with Brian James and Crime Wave. Tango and Cash has a, a moment where Robert Zadar is talking to Sylvester Stallone and Kurt Russell and says about how Stallone had broken his jaw, his chin, because he has essentially a, a shelf around the bottom of his yeah. jaw that, that juts out, and he, it's a massive chin. Kurt Russell jokingly turns to Sylvester Stallone and says, You broke that jaw? Yeah. He's a very particular looking actor. I I do like Robert Zadar a great deal. He's he's not the best actor in the world, but he does make sort of really trashy, good fun movies like Samurai Cop, and I think he was in the sequel to Frog Town, um, Return to Frog Town. I mean, he had quite yeah. a look even without the prosthetic makeup. It was quite did, a yeah. sight to behold. And on top of that, he is a brick shit yes, house of a man he as is. well. He's huge. Yeah, um, having to go up against that, you know, Bruce Campbell's no reed in the wind, but whenever the two go face to face, you know, he just uh, looks puny. <laughs> it does, yeah, and that, that's that's kind of funny. Therein, it makes a nice segue to the the action in this film, and the action is brilliant. Yeah, it is. Everything is physically done. There's there's no trickery or anything like that. That where, where they. The, the whole action climax, I, I believe Bruce Campbell was saying, I want to do this, but they, they had to say, no, 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 we, we need to put a stuntman mm. in there because there's a re- very real chance you're going to die. So we need someone who is <laughs> less expendable than you, or more expendable than you. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, so, you know, the the action is, is great in this film, and it only gets better as the, the sequels go on, that Maniac Cop 2 is a particularly notable action film. And uh, that, that's the other side of this. It's not just a horror film. It's it's an action yeah. film. Well, as I said, you don't really right. know as it, as it starts, what is this a horror film or is this more of a action-y thriller? It, it, it keeps you guessing, and that's that's what I liked about it. 
Yeah, yeah. It, it's a particularly excellent film. I, I really do love it. And there are a number of good DVD and Blu-ray releases that I would recommend anyone goes and checks out because uh, the, the Arrow one that came out isn't particularly good. It's not. It doesn't feature any commentaries. And uh, I have... I was I was a bit chipped on it whenever Elite released the uh, the special edition DVD. Uh, it had the the Bruce Campbell commentary on it, or it's all advertised across the packaging. But whenever I put it in and I went to watch the commentary, it wasn't yeah. there. It mustn't have recorded for whatever reason, uh, which is a bit annoying. I know that Bruce Campbell doesn't actually say particularly nice things about, which is a bit odd. He's uh, the story of how they actually started filming this film. I think the the St. Patrick's Day parade sequence is the the bit that they shot first, and that was before they got any funding or anything to make the rest of the film. They went, well, are we going to do this because the parade is tomorrow? Uh, Bruce, go and stand over there, no. <laughs> and they started shooting his shots in St. Patrick's Day parade in uh, New, uh, New York. And that made it a, a bit more of an interesting take on it as well. Whenever you sit back and watch it and go, they shot this before anything else, before they'd actually got the green light to make the film. They were out doing this particular bit. And that takes us back to Bruce's roots of being a, of, of making short films and all that kind of stuff. And it, it, it's, it's kind of a nice bit of trivia, I think, um, to add on to it well, as well. Because they only filmed three days in New York, so I'm guessing that's pretty much the St. Patrick's Day Parade and a couple of other bits I mean, the chase sequence is certainly recognisable as being filmed in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But Hollywood has a very good reputation for filming New York and L.A. somehow. And, and also the, the people they threw into the mix as well. Um, on, on IMDb, you can see a list of the cameos that, that they had. And well, Sam Raimi is a, a notable Definitely. one as uh, the reporter during the parade. But also uh, boxer Jake LaMotta yep. uh, was a detective in the film. And then obviously uh, they, they listed as a cameo, but he wasn't. He was a credited actor on it. Richard Rointree, mm -hmm. who played Shaft, is, is the commissioner in the film as well. And the director himself, Bill Lustig. He's the hotel runs, manager. The uh, the Sam Raimi cameo appearance made me go back and double check who did direct this because I suddenly thought, is this a Sam Raimi direct film? I had to go and double check because <laughs> I saw him in it. That actually becomes a recurring thing throughout the entire series, or the, the entire series, all three films. Mm. Uh, there's interesting cameos from from the Raimis um, throughout the films, which uh, I I, I kind of think is is a bit of a fun nod. Um, and the way they keep that going is is good. But uh, you're absolutely right about Laureen Landon. She she's a a particularly interesting character in this film, and I I like the fact that she plays the role that your typical '80s hero would have played. Mm. Um, and again in the in the next film as well, she has a notable contribution to the film's um to the film's overall story story arc. And I, I'm looking forward to seeing what you have to say about the the next film in the series because the two of them fit together really nicely. And it won't be too long before you get to watch yeah. that, which is See, I was quite fun. worried watching this with the end. I was thinking, is this going to drift into that same repetitive type? The monster keeps coming back, horror, like uh, Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street. They, I mean, they kept bringing it back, bringing it back. And I was wasn't sure if that's the way it was going to go, if they were going to do something different. But, yeah, I'll, I'm definitely curious to see where they take this in the next film. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I don't want to spoil it for you in any way, because I, I, won't, I won't spoil the next one for you. But uh, it's uh, it, it's satisfying the way they do things uh, between the first two. And, and it really does work. They get a sequel for legitimate reasons. That's good. Yeah, so uh, the other film that uh, Bruce was part of, uh, and I have my theories about it, which I'll, I'll share, uh, in 1988 was a, a little-known horror film called The Carrier from 1988. Now, this is a, a bit of an oddity. It fits into that part of his career where he's not in the film um, and he, he receives credit for uh, his sound recording skills. And by this stage, uh, I'd say that Bruce has become a, a professional sound recorder uh, to the stars, you know, because he's... He, he, he's got sound recording credits for a number of films over his, uh, his filmography and th th I guess that comes from what they learnt on the original Evil Dead because they were able to put the, uh, put a lot of effort into the, the audio side of things and, and Bruce seemed to take centre stage but looking at the back of the DVD cover 
and I track down the moment in the film where Bruce's contribution is heard, uh, is that um, it says the music is by, by Joseph Leducca, um, spelt incorrectly on the back of the DVD, yeah. which is uh, <laughs> of Army of Darkness and Evil Dead fame. And Sound Mix and Monsters Scream is by actor Bruce Campbell of Army of Darkness. And there's actually a, a version of it you can get on, on DVD. I can't see it now. I can't find it for the life of me. That actually brandishes his name on the front cover saying Bruce Campbell, which is a bit unfair. But that, that happens quite a bit throughout his uh, his filmography, and we'll point that out whenever it happens. But Bruce provides the scream of the monster um, about 20 minutes into the film that, well, it, it, it gets the film rolling. Uh, the film isn't particularly about a monster, but there is a monster in it, and the monster <laughs> despite it happening, actually gets forgotten as the film goes on, and it, it's more about cats than any, anything. The Carrier is not a good film. <laughs> it, it lost me along the way. I have to admit that I started using my phone halfway through it. And, At least you made uh, it halfway it... through before you started using your phone. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I started using my phone about twenty-two minutes into it you, you after the monster. Minutes. Yeah. Well, I was I was uh, looking for a monster that I would be able to attribute Bruce Campbell's voice to. <laughs> right. Darkman is something similar to this, where Dark, Bruce provided a number of screams and things in Darkman, and if you have a finely tuned ear. You can pick them out, and it's one of the many contributions that Bruce made to Dark Man uh, in, in his production. The Carrier, I would not say in any way possible you would be able to go, oh, well, that's Bruce. No, it's it's just a scream that is that has a number of sound effects over the top of it. Uh, I can't actually believe that this is being discussed because you, you wouldn't pick it out at all. And what my theory is that. Uh, Perhaps, uh, given that uh, Joe Leduca had done the music on this, he might have been able to add a couple of Foley sounds to to the production and maybe had a copy of uh, a scream from Bruce and he was able to put it in there and maybe disguise it a little so it wasn't quite as obvious. Where they were lacking a scream, he was able to provide a scream. And when this was mentioned, maybe in an interview, uh, some of the fanboys on the on the internet have gone and gone. Well, Bruce Campbell's obviously in the Carrier, <laughs> so it, it's become one of his official credits. That's my theory. That's not. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say that that's in any way true. If anyone wants to correct me on that, Gareth at a year in the career dot com, do tell me the story. But uh, right now, I, I I wouldn't advise anyone bother uh, with the carrier because it's just it's not very good and if you're looking for bruce in it you'll be very 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 disappointed did you did you bother with the I carrier not, at all no when i saw his credit i thought uh, and i read about it the film and i thought that really isn't for me so i i passed on it i will admit and uh yeah. simon at the year in the career if you want to berate me for it <laughs> well, it, it has been released on Blu-ray, which I was a bit shocked by, um, and it, it's had a couple of uh, releases over the years on video and DVD. However, it's incredibly out of print. It's very, very difficult to find. You can get it on YouTube, but I'm not advising that you watch it that way, because obviously purchasing and paying for things is the best way to support the, the industry. Mm. Uh, but yeah, it, it's on YouTube, and... <clears throat> That might be how I watched it, but yeah, um, it was all done in research. And had it been available, I absolutely would have purchased it because it, it's something that would sit quite happily in my Bruce Campbell collection that is ever growing. All right, well, um, we could just about round this up unless you've got anything else you'd like to add. No, I, I think I've added everything. Cool, cool. All right, well, we'll be back next week with a, a look at 1989 in which uh, Bruce Campbell gets a starring role in Moontrap. He has a cameo in Scott Spiegel's best film, Intruder. And uh, he has a number of other little roles as well, which uh, which we're going to talk about when we come back to you next week. Please remember to drop us a review wherever you happen to pick up this podcast. You can email us or you can tweet us. And please just share us with anyone you think would benefit from hearing all about Bruce Campbell's career. Uh, take care, everyone, and we'll talk to you soon. Take care.
Forrest. Let's get him. Yo, Let get him. Call me. Can't you see what the hell's going on? Don't you go giving any orders. I had to put a bullet right between your eyes.